Thanks, Callan. Um, we have an absolutely terrific panel here. Um, and I'd already started having a bit of a conversation with Andrew from ANZ and realized that I was probably asking him all the same questions that all of you want to hear as well, so I stopped. Um, but we have um, Andrew Baird, who is an operations expert from ANZ, um, Sahida Frawley, who's the head of digital business services from SAP, um, Kirsty Richards, the program leader in autism and agriculture from Sunport <laughs> Farms. Daniel Barr, who's our head of identity and access management at NAB. And Michael Fieldhouse, social impact leader from DXC Technology. So I might start just by getting each of you to introduce yourselves a, a little bit. And um, if you can share with everybody um, some of the some of the good work that that your organisation's been doing. Andrew, might kick off with you. Sure. Great. So I'm Andrew Baird. So I'm from ANZ. I've been there for, gasp for breath, 32 years. Um, so I've done probably about 10 significant different jobs in that time. So probably changing every three years, but in one organisation, which is quite an amazing feat these days. Um, more recently, we've been involved with the Spectrum Program for Autistic Employment, um, which has been wonderful to see um, the individuals grow and develop, some of them changing their lives forever, in fact, like moving out of home and all that sort of stuff. So it's really great to see. Thanks, Andrew. Sahida. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Sahida Frawley um, from SAP. Um, SAP has been on the journey since 2013. I, myself, and Australia has been on the journey since 2016. Um, so for me, I headed up, um, at the time, our public sector um, services and support team and did a little bit of internal agitation as, why couldn't we do something in Australia and New Zealand? Why were we only doing it globally? Um, and now um, have the privilege of um, sitting on the ANZ executive and being the executive sponsor for SAP at ANZ for Autism at Work. Hi everyone, my name's Kirsty Richards. I am actually a veterinarian um, by background, so this is uh, definitely um, a totally um, different area to be working in for me. I work for Sunpork Farms. We farm just over half a million animals across um, Australia New Zealand, and that represents about 15% of Australian pork production. Um, late in 2016, we embarked um, in collaboration with the Autism CRC and Specialist Stern on an autism employment program that we call Autism and Agriculture. Uh, we now employ 12 autistic um, people in animal care roles across our sites in South Australia and Queensland. And in doing this, we're recognising the strengths that some autistic people have in looking, uh, caring for animals. Thank you. Uh, so Daniel Barr, uh, Head of Identity and Access Management at NAB. So we're, we're relatively early, early on our journey um, as part of the Dandelion Program. We've got six neurodiverse team members that have been with us since uh, the back end of May. We've also got two fantastic helpers that are, that are with us on that journey as well. Um, and our, our team members are working across a variety of areas as it relates to identity and access management, so fulfilment, controls, automation, coding and development, things of that nature. And we put some quotes up at the start of the day and also talked about 23% efficiency uplift. So we're already reaping the benefits and we're the best part of 10 weeks in, right? So you can only imagine what it's going to look like in a couple more months and a couple more years. So I'm really excited to be here and, and happy to sort of talk through that journey with you. Thank you, um, Michael Fieldhouse, um, um, Social Impact Leader for DXC, but um, started the Danline program in 2013. Uh, we now have over 100 plus autistic people in the program and also have given over 70 plus um, people work experience as well um, as part of our collaborations through the neurodiversity hubs. Thank you. Um, Michael, might just stay with you for a minute. Um, what differences have you seen um, in the take-up from the employers during the time that you've been with, with DXC? Yeah, so I think um, Australia was lagging a little bit you know, compared to the rest of the world. Um, um, the US, I think, started uh, um, probably a lot earlier in some of the ideology, um, I think. But we've actually caught up in probably in our regards to um, 
having more sustainable models. <coughs> I think that's um, one thing we've actually kind of been um, uh, very good at. Um, but I think, you know, uptake now, um, more people are talking about neurodiversity. You've got, you know, we had um, Dr. Lawrence Fong, Fong who is actually, you've got number one university in the in the world, you know. Um, they've got to make around neurodiversity, so will that make a change? You've got um, Cornell University that uh, have got the Institute of Disability Employment with Professor Suzanne Brer. So there's kind of messages coming down from um, leading universities now filtering into our universities as well, which is going to, I think, make a, make a difference. Great. Thank you. Daniel, um, why did NAB decide to embark upon this neurodiversity challenge? Uh, so, good question, and we, I think, highlighted it a little bit earlier on. So, th there's been certain individuals along this journey that have been really instrumental in driving this through, you know, Katrina yourself, and I am going to point her out, even though I said I wouldn't. So, Tracy, stand up, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That's all right. So... <laughs> So, so that's one of the main reasons, right? So Tracy Edwards has been fundamental in driving this through from an ab standpoint. Um, we've we've been on the journey for a little while, trying to trying to to get this program implemented. Um, David Fairman, who's our new, new chief security officer, has been there roughly about twelve months, um, has been instrumental as well in terms of driving this through from a senior management standpoint. So so getting buy-in at that level as well. Um, and then when Tracy brought it to to the management team and said, look, this is what we're looking at doing. Do we have some areas we think would be um, open to, to a program of this nature, you know, my hand was up in a second, right? Because the, the opportunity to introduce some diversity as it relates to, to neurodiversity, cultural diversity, you know, um, gender diversity, we're always looking for how we can improve as a broader team, right? Uh, and the respective skills that, that different individuals bring. Um, so, so for us, it, it was a bit of a no-brainer. Um, as I said, we've been only, only been on this journey since, since May, so it's relatively new uh, for us. But... It's, it's been something that we've been pretty passionate about uh, in terms of putting the right structures in place, the right models in place, the right support structures um, around the individuals coming into the bank so that we can make this a sustainable long-term um, benefit, not just for us, but the individuals themselves. Thanks, Daniel. Kirsty, I might ask the same question of you. Why did Sunport decide to um, enter into looking for a neurodiverse population in your organisation? Ours is a, um, it comes back a little bit more to workforce logistics. Um, we work in agriculture, there's a, a huge shortage of qualified competent people um, and we suffer a big drain whenever mining gets good, farming <laughs> loses all of our good employees. Um, and we're concentrated sort of um, Darling Downs in Queensland and sort of both north and south of Adelaide. So when mining does get good, that is exactly what happens. Um, so we have that challenge from an agricultural perspective and we could see that in the autism community, there's a real challenge in terms of unemployment and underemployment. And for us, there is a great compatibility between what we needed and what the autism community had to offer. Great, thanks. Sakita. Um SEP's been on that uh, journey for a bit longer than, than some of the other employers, yes. NAB, um, on the panel. Um, how has the, the introduction of neurodiversity affected or influenced your organisation? Okay. So, yes, SAP has been on the journey for a while, and I think very much, and I think many of us sit back in, in workplaces and we talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, and, and SAP, we use um, the term differently abled. Um, for, and, and for me, that was a key message of, and it was interesting listening to this morning as well, of uh, looking at the strengths that you're perceiving and, and certainly looking at, you know, what could we do in that space? Um, SAP, uh, um, with, with us, others have done a lot of research globally that that diversity actually breeds your innovation, your collaboration, your productivity. Um, and um, certainly um, in the ANZ, as a leadership team, it was also, OK, what are we going to do? Um, and I think, um, and I like that you called out certain individuals because it does take individuals in your organisation um, who are brave enough to stick up their hands and sponsor the idea because everybody says, yeah, yeah it's a great thing, we need to be doing it. Um, but, but who's going to take that first step um, to not just say we should do it but own it and, and move it forward? And I think that's the key part of success. Where with SAP, for those that... 
um, have a voice. And for me, it was um, exposure to others. I have friends with children on the spectrum, um, others that I'd previously worked with and, um, and saw the talent and the potential. Um, and it was, why can't we do something? And, and what you'll, oh, I think what everybody will find is you will find. And for me, um, at the time, my executive sponsor was my boss, who, who sat on the executive of SAP. And, and he said, OK, well, tell me what we need to do. Um, and I think everybody's got to be brave enough within your workplace to go ask that. Because there is a lot of science that you can pull on to actually prove that it's a good thing for your workplace. Um, then it comes down to many individuals to want to drive it. So that, that really was... It is a drive within SAP of how we can be better. And for many of us it is, this is a key part of how can we be a better organisation. Um, better employer, um, better group of people to work with, I think. And many um, this morning spoke about um, at the executive breakfast what it brings to your workplace, actually. So it's not just what we do for the individuals, but what does it bring to your workplace that I think is a really key... Uh, part of this. Thank and, you. and certainly with my global colleagues, I spent a lot of time speaking to my global colleagues before I convinced people here. It, that was the message that was very loud and clear uh, of the impact that that had. Thank you. Andrew, ANZ also has been on this journey for longer than, than some have. of us. Um, so um, how, has, how has that impacted um, your organisation? Um, look, incredibly, we've been on the journey. I think we launched um, 2017. Matt, who's also in the room for a bit of a shout out, who was a, a pioneer in our early days, um, was, was launching the program. Um, diverse talent is what we want. We also are looking to there's vast rates of attrition in certain areas in, in technology. Is there's lots of competition for young talent and diverse talent. So. We're looking at ways to, to counteract some of that, and this is definitely an untapped pool, um, largely untapped, less so, <laughs> less so these days, um, for, that, for that talent. So that's really changing that, and the teams that the individuals start to work in really understand that, and they can see the benefits. And like NAB are seeing with 23% increases, we're also seeing great increases in productivity, um, the vast amount of, of training that they consume and work product that they consume um, is is incredible what you see. So the productivity, yes, increases. Um, executive buy-in, um, fully supportive executive board um, and team members. So. Um, maybe ask a question of all of you. Um, what advice do you have for employers who are considering transitioning to the neurodiverse workforce? I'll start. I'll say, as we said this morning, um, just do it, give it a go. Um, you don't know what you don't know. Everyone is different. Um, the neurodiverse workforce has immense talent. Um, and yes, we represent ANZ um, for tech. Um, that's where our program currently sits. We would like to love to expand that more broadly. Obviously, you've got Sunpork here, it's non-tech. Um, so there's lots of abilities that they have. I'd agree, just do it, <laughs> absolutely, just do it. Um, and um, we've got individuals who are part of our, our project management office, individuals who are part of our development team in New Zealand um, at the moment. Um, globally, all sorts of roles, legal, financials, um, so across the spectrum, uh, so acro across the business spectrum of all the different roles that we have. Um, the learning, I think everybody... Um, gravitates to, of course, you're going to train the managers who are, you know, the day-to-day -day managers of these individuals. Um, you need to put structure in place for them. I think probably the biggest learning as we reflected on what had been successful in some of our offices versus others. In our smaller offices, the Canberra office where I have one graduate and, um, and an intern, um, we, with that entire office at the time, three years ago, that office was about 50 people. We did, not just with the managers, but with the induction of the whole office, um, you know, basically a learning. And it was a, a you know, a, a learning in communications. It wasn't just a learning about, hey, we've got people on the spectrum coming into the office. Um, and it was follow-up learning. So I think where we've done that, it has been far more successful because, quite frankly, it's been an enabler from a HR, you know, a better manager, better community, better workforce, better, you know, um, co-worker perspective. Um, that, that's probably the learning. And the offices where we didn't do that because we thought they were too large, those are the ones where we sort of struggled a little bit more to find the right home and the right fit and we didn't have as much of that organisational impact. 
Firstly, I totally agree with everything you just said. Um, awareness across the business is... I, I can't underestimate how important it is. Um, oh, sorry, underemphasise. For us, though, um, it's really been about shifting the paradigm from thinking about positions to thinking about people. So if you can do that, then all it is is about working out how to employ a person. And, and, and if you can start thinking that way, the rest becomes easy. What do I need to do to make it easy for this person to apply for my job, to get my job and to keep my job? And, you, and then you just work out what the job might comprise later. And we never thought we'd be able to do it because our jobs are very structured, but it isn't actually that hard once you start thinking about it. The other thing, I, the other piece of advice I would give to employees is it needs to be, you need to have support top down you need to have your executive on board. There's big decisions in terms of company culture and company protocols, how it all works, that need to be made and you need to have that commitment. But equally, you need ground up. You need every single person on the ground engaged and aware and committed because at the end of the day, these are the people that your autistic employers are working side by side every day and these are the people that enable their day-to-day -day lives. Um, pretty much exactly the same. Um, so e echo a lot of the same comments there. We, we tried to ensure that anyone um, in the immediate team did mandatory training as, as a default. Anyone within uh, the next sort of layer um, uh, of that respective ecosystem um, was offered training as well and we had a really strong uptake of that too. And then just broader general awareness training as well for, for managers that may only have a light touch but still just to be aware of what the program was, what we were doing, interactions, how they could be best positioned to assist as well. So, again, driven, you know, top down, bottom up across the board. And the other thing we did as part of the, the hiring process was trying to ensure that we placed people with skills and abilities in the areas that they would thrive, right? So if they were strong programmers, that's where we would put them. If they were great from a data analyst standpoint, that's where we would put them to, to, to try and make that transition as easy as possible, yeah? So as we're going along now, we're continuing to monitor type of work they enjoy doing, where do they thrive, how do they thrive, what, is those, you know, what does the, the environment look like that they work best in, and tailor that accordingly, yeah? So, so constant dialogue with the team on the ground and the team that is helping facilitate the program as well. So, so it doesn't just stop the day they arrive, it's a continuous piece as you go. Thanks, so um, I'll just um, probably add on something from my experience just coming back from the US, uh, talking to a number of employers is actually also collecting um, clear expectations but um, if you can establish a, a program or hiring initiative. So what's actually in the program? So being very clear in regards to for indivi individuals applying. So are you providing support, not providing support? And also very clear expectations for the, for the management and the co-workers to understanding what they're getting in support. So everyone knows that there's, you know, if you are not providing any support, I mean, that's, if that's the actual decision, that's very clear in the actual decision making. Thank you. Um, and a couple of you have touched on this a little bit, but um, are there any challenges that you've experienced um, and how have you been overcoming them? Yeah, I can, one of the biggest challenges we've had is actually un the understanding the difference between autism and mental health. So that was our, our biggest epiphany um, when we first started the program. So we had to re kind of reinvent a lot of the mental health support networks we had. So um, there, were, uh, there are some obviously some stats, that, you know, um, and I say it's the elephant in the room. That eighty percent of people with um, that have autism have a comorbidity, uh, and that's something to be not afraid of, but it's just to know. And um, we've actually got better mental health support now by knowing that, and that's actually as um, kind of um, provided managers getting better um, understanding how to provide mental health. Um, uh, support for people that are non-autistic. So it actually been a, it's, that was a, an opportunity rather than a challenge. And I, I love that, turning the, the challenge into an opportunity yeah. and actually um, using that as an opportunity to get better mental health um, understanding as well. Oh, oh, it was absolutely epiphany to a lot of our managers and, and, and team leaders. They, they've now learned a whole bunch of new skills that are just going to be helping them for the, their future careers in management. Great, thank you. Um, Dan, not sure if it's too early for you to have any challenges, but um, any um, that you're, you're seeing at the moment? Um, my biggest challenge has been finding enough desks, to be honest, right, for, for our new staff members. If you work at NAB, you'll, you'll feel me on that. Um, 
So, so not particularly. The thing I would say is we, we have Karen and Aidan that, that are embedded within our team that are support staff dedicated to this program. Uh, and that's been fantastic, right? So, so assisting us with understanding where there may be challenges, uh, how we can best assist with that, uh, sort of helping to bridge the gap where required. So it's almost like that constant training and assisting the, the, the staff and myself as required. Um, but, but from my standpoint, it's, it's going fantastically so far. Good. Kirsty, any challenges? Yes, yeah, so we're almost three years down the track with our first employees. Um, we've encountered lots of challenges. Um, that's not to say they're bad things. We've learned from them all and I would totally agree we've improved our systems. Um, as one example, we have just employed a social worker full time. Now for that to happen in agriculture is massive. <laughs> I'm not aware of any precedent for that worldwide, and we are we are setting a um, setting a new goal point for the the sector. Um, our if I could break our challenges up inside the workplace, it almost always comes back to autism awareness. It's people forgetting, or it's people being too busy, people having other priorities on, and they just they just forget. They just you know it, it, they they just lapse. Um, in terms of autism awareness, we've delivered awareness training to, I would say, in excess of 600 staff. And we're doing that again and again. This Monday and Tuesday of this week, just past, we have started again in South Australia. So we've gone back to square one and started with basic autism awareness and then some extension strategies in the workplace. We don't differentiate between mentors and managers and um, people with less reach or less touch, as you mentioned before, everyone gets the same training. Um, Outside the workplace, a big eye-opener for us has been um, the lack of support for individuals to maintain employment. There's a lot of support for people to get work. There's not an awful lot of support for people to stay in work. And by that support, I'm talking about the lifestyle factors. It's, it's shopping, it's cooking food, it's setting up a routine at home, it's um, cleanliness in the house, it's working out how you're going to make some friends, if you're living in a new town, what opportunities are there for you? And that's, as an employer, that's difficult for us to address because it's outside our remit. But at the same time, what happens outside work really translates into <coughs> productivity inside the workplace. So we have made it our problem and we are extending our support to that area of their lives. That's terrific. Um... So we've been doing it for three years. Um, it, it, for me, it was interesting when I compared uh, some of the other experiences where we had done, um, you know, three in one office in the camera office, four in New Zealand. Um, in our Sydney office, we had um, uh, three um, autism interns, but they were all in different parts of our business, so they weren't all a part of the same pod or the same team. Um, that certainly, I think, of um, having more of a team nature to the introduction, I think... Uh, provides more strength, or at least a pairing, um, than one individual in a pod who is, the, the, you know, the new person who is on the spectrum as well. I think um, a lesson for us is that's probably far more uh, challenging. Th those individuals certainly learnt and gained a lot out of that, but we probably haven't had that same um, connection and success um, with those individuals. Uh, one of the learnings because it has been going for, for three years where... Um, you hope that, you know, or you have this view that you've got to make sure that you ha offer them a full-time permanent job at the end as we had a couple of interns. And w we were fortunate enough to have one of our interns in Canberra who, who loved her job, uh, almost gave up uni at one point to, to come and join us and then realised that actually she, she was studying political sciences. That was her passion. And um, she almost felt guilty to come and have a chat to me that she was actually... She'd been offered a job. Um, she, we had um, assisted her in it. She got an um, internship... Um, to work in the US um, uh, for a period of time and after coming back from that she got an offer in a minister's office and, and she was torn because it was you've done so much for me and how do I and it was like absolutely go fly <laughs> you know um, so I think uh, but there are a lot of people uh, in our office who are doing that but we've invested so much time and effort well you do that with lots of people you know so that's a learning of um, maybe you know you've also got to reflect on what you've done for them in their career because not everybody stays in the same job forever um, is also just as important as whether they're with you in two years' time, three years' time, four years' time. Where, where have they actually gone to next, I think, was a, a great reflection and learning for us as well. Thank you. 
Andrew. Um, I think main challenges for us certainly is uh, awareness training across across the organisation. So we have an online training which we get email out and get people to do. Um, we would like uptake to be greater on that. So I think you know we do training with Meredith, our ASC, who's here um, face to face with the teams that the individuals are going to interact more with, um, and that goes down really well. Um, but it's about making it wider to the organisation. Um, and it's how we how we do that. And ANZ is global, so there's lots of contact with India, um, the Philippines, and China as well. Just not just within in Australia, and of course across all states. So and New Zealand, get New Zealand. Um, so I think that's the that's one of our main challenges. Um, the other one is we have some some autistic people coming through the door, not through our spectrum program. So we have a, a graduate who's autistic. Um, he has certain challenges um, and we're just having to work out how we can help him as part of our program. So we can't not help him because we have an, a program that supports autistic people but he's not part of the program. So that's one of our challenges that we're working through. So, And we do have some other autistic people who are now in the organisation and calling out for a little bit of help. So it's how we manage that. And so just um, want to pick up on that a bit a little more. So... Um, in terms of success for um, people on the spectrum, um, do you feel that it's, it's better to be part of the programme or um, are you trying to um, push the message out more to the broader community so that there's no need for programme? What, yeah, what I think you, ultimate, the ultimate game is that there is no programme and that people just come through the door um, and they are supported of what, what needs to be supported for them. Um, Yes, this grad may benefit from being on the program, but he's not, so we need to provide that support as needed. But yeah, ultimately, we don't want to have a program. We want to change our processes so that people just come through and continue to come through as they, as they do. Thank you. Um, before you embarked upon this, um, was there any opposition to setting up the program? Um, and if so, how did you get... How did you get through that? I actually don't think we had any real opposition to the program. Like, there's always the the number figure that always comes around for, for business cases and things like that. But, um, you know, we approached our Chief Information Security Officer, Linwin, uh, similarly to, to NAB with their um, exec in, in cyber. And it was a really... It was a conversation over a cup of tea. Linwin loves a cup of tea. Um, and it was it was a yes from from that thirty minute conversation, and then we Matt and I approached the the executive tech board, um, and it was just the right thing to do. I think half of them were almost in tears about what we wanted to do. They just understood. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Jay here from Specialist Dan might remember this um, the scenario we had um, quite staunch opposition from a management level. Um, a member of our team who is actually the production manager at one of our piggeries um, and he was and now is employing a number of autistic um, people. Um, he had personal experience with autism that led him to believe that it was never going to be compatible in any workplace and that in our particular scenario that it posed significant work health and safety um, concerns. So they were quite legitimate concerns. Um, what we did and we continue to do this, is we engaged with him, we listened to him, um, we took his concerns very seriously and we gave him an opportunity to have his input. What do you want to do? How do you think we could manage this? And he is now one of our biggest proponents. Like, we'll not let you get near um, our autistic employees if he thinks you're going to do anything that he doesn't want done. <laughs> Like, and he'll, he'll turn up with marshmallow biscuits and, like, he just, you know, he'll be the one that's going to help them um, if they've locked themselves out of a house. Um, so you guys need to bear in mind our communities, our, our guys are living um, in rural communities. Um, if things happen, they need to rely on the people around them. Um, you, you don't necessarily have the services available you do in the city. So this particular manager who I vividly recall just said, this will not work is the guy who's going out at 11 o'clock at night to help someone break into their own house, quite happily. So I'd say it's about engagement, it's about validating their concerns and it's about giving them some, um, some control over what's happening. 
route. That, that sounds like quite um, active uh, opposition. Was there any passive opposition when you started going through the, the programme that perhaps you hadn't realised was, was there? I would say no because we everyone was involved in autism, autism awareness and that came up in the first instance. It was, and it, it was largely due to ignorance. People had never had any experience of autism. They'd never met an autist or never knowingly met an autistic person. As soon as you move through that and as soon as they met our trainees... So our trainees spend two weeks working on farm um, and they're actually in the farm scenario so they're exposed on a day-to-day -day basis to all of our employees... It just melts. There is the perceived hurdle is not a hurdle um, once there's that awareness and interaction. Excellent. I would describe. It's funny. I think when you talk about it, and my description would be, of course, no one's going to say, of course, you shouldn't do that. You know, everybody in a leadership position is going to say, absolutely, it's the right thing to do. We should be looking at creating a more diverse workplace, and those that are differently abled should be part of that workplace. Um, I think the unconscious bias for me comes, and, and SAP has not stood it up, uh, locally or globally, as a series of headcount that are granted to you to go do this program. So they are existing headcount out of the business. So someone is clearly saying, this is a role that I'm going to hire. I'm not going to hire anybody else. It's not a plus one um, to actually take on someone who is on the spectrum. Um, I, I would describe it as SAP and I think it's a challenge for all of us if you actually ask people to give up a headcount that they had, not that they were being granted an extra. Um, I think there's still an unconscious bias because people do that, but I need that job filled and maybe that person couldn't do that job as well as someone else I could hire. Um, and this is why I do love the, the conversation around the strengths that they bring so what are you actually looking for in the team and, and why are you hiring that particular individual? What strengths are they going to bring that someone who may not be um, neurodiverse bring to your team? So actually challenging that lens. Because within SAP it, it is the, the challenge of you are, you are saying one of the headcount, you know, because you're not, there's not a plus one <laughs> um, of I'm deliberately making that decision to make sure that the workload that I've got is going to be done by that team and that role. So I think there is still for us, and, and we have um, uh, six roles at the moment in ANZ, to continue to challenge our business to give up roles and headcount to be part of the program. Um, so. I think one of the, you just add on, the, on one of the challenges that we had was probably more passive in regards to was more um, dealing with change. Obviously, um, you know, IT companies now are more like financial services organisations. We're constantly keeping up with technology shifts, um, you know, restructures, how are they going to cope with change? And that was one of the major discussion points we had um, was just the dealing with how would that work and how would managers, especially when you work in a very fluid international market, these things just... Before you know it, you've you know you now need more cyber people. Now we need more data analytics people, or now we you know we're not we're moving testing to Philippines. It all kind of you know all happens within a moment, and so that was a, a big intellectual discussion within the um, within the corporation. Daniel, any passive resistance or no, 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 not really. Um, you know, we're a big bank and it's the mechanics of getting this through the system, right, which from not a resistance standpoint but just a process can, can delay it, right, and that's why you do need individuals that are really sort of championing the effort, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think we mentioned we've been on this journey for a couple of years but we've only just landed the team members through the door, right. So I, I don't think that's a, a conscious um, bias towards... Um, neurodiverse people, it's just the mechanics of how this would work in a large organisation. But I think being able to demonstrate the benefits we get um, and whether we're using headcount or not um, on such programs and individuals will only hasten that, right? So when we go in and have a conversation with other parts of the organisation now and we talk to the efficiency gains, the productivity uplift, the simplification that we're achieving, that won't happen, right? So uh, I think as we continue to have these sort of conversations, as events like this, I would, I would encourage anyone that's thinking of doing this, the, you know, if you're finding resistors where you can to bring them to an event like this, I don't know how you could resist it 
after seeing, you know, the conversations we've had today, the, 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 the evidence that, that's being produced through the respective research institutes, you know, that this is only going to become more compelling as we go, right? So, no, we haven't really encountered too much <coughs> passive or otherwise resistance. Great, thank you. Um, I'll ask one more question and then we'll maybe um, throw to the floor for, I'm sure you all have lots of questions out there. Um, what, what are your organisation's plans for the future um, for building your diverse workforces, Michael? Um, one of our biggest probably focuses at the moment is our collaboration with the Israeli Defence Forces. We've got the oldest program on the globe. Um, they recruit about 120 autistic people a year. So knowing how to do it to scale and management. So they're things we're learning how to do um, and actually how to support them. So that was probably one of the things we've been... Um, we got permission from the Department of Defence about three years ago to have that collaboration. Very kindly. Thanks, Lindsay. And um, we then went through um, obviously converting some of those tools that we do use in the program from Hebrew to English and revalidating them. And we're very much focused on in getting some of those human... Re we've got a lot more human resource management tools focused for autistic people. So we're really going to be um, kind of doubling down on that. Fantastic. Uh, so from our side, it would just be continue to leverage what we've started within my function across the broader NAB, right? And where we can uh, look for opportunities to uh, impact the business in positive ways um, potentially not just from a tech standpoint, but a, a broader business context as well. Um, so really it's a, how do we take this onwards and upwards from what we've achieved to date. Great. Kirsty? Um, so two perspectives for Sunport. Um, from a neurodiverse perspective, onward and upward, um, we see no barriers to continuing to employ autistic people. Um, we have 10% of two of our farms workforces currently on the spectrum and you just... We don't notice it, other than we get some great innovations happening and just different ways of thinking about the same old things. Um, from a business perspective, that's the bigger challenge for us. It's driving the deep cultural change um, around what is fundamentally best practice for everyone. Um, that's, I think, the bigger challenge for us is all of the deep level change to things like how we recruit people, how we induct people, um, what sort of support we have in the workplace, all of that, that, that's the bigger challenge for us but that's something we're totally committed to because we know we can't drive our autism program forward without doing that. Um, for us at SAP and ANZ, I think it is to really to expand what we've done. So we've got two key locations that I think are are growing and, and thriving and getting that across all of our business and all of our offices and, and make you know, greater penetration in that. So it is expanding it further to where we are today. Thanks. Um, yes, absolutely, expansion. We'd love to take it outside of tech at ANZ. Um, it's how we, how we do that, that, the way that we do it would make sense. Um, but also we're looking to grow our early talent pipeline as well. So that's part of Spectrum. It's our grads and interns and return to work program and stuff as well. So it's a, a large endeavour. Thank you. Um, what questions do you have? Just for the organisations that, sorry, just for the organisations that are, are way down the line and um, have been doing the programs for some time, just wondering, um, do the people that have come through your programs, um, the neurodiverse people, do they have any uh, input into what it looks like, what it feels like, um, to help it be more successful? Um, yeah, I, look, I think we're open to that. We haven't. It's not something we've proactively done. Like we get feedback from the from the individuals on what's working well and what isn't. Um, but certainly, it's something we can certainly consider. The group. The groups that we have are quite social and, yeah, I'm sure they would welcome the opportunity to, pr to provide that. Um, there are a couple of people in our recent cohort where we've asked them to be engaged in some other activities in ANZ in, in helping out in other areas and they've put their hand up and quite happy to participate in doing that as well. Michael. 
Yeah, we go through our formal review every year uh, with the with the program, uh, with all the people and the um, all the participants. As the um, it's at different stages, it's actually quite good. So now we're almost six years in. You get a six year snapshot. Um, we also balance that with um, we've got evidence based research underneath the program. So we did get another um, just done by Latrobe. So um, Dr. Darren Henley, where are you? He's not here, no, oh, from Latrobe. So if you want to actually talk to him, there's a um, lot of evidence base around it. Um, that gives us a, a very independent look at what's going on, um, which is quite quite important. This was talking a little bit about the mental health that came up in our first snapshot. Uh, surprised us when we first were doing it, because um, none when we first looked at none of the service providers actually understood it. So this gave us a kind of an idea about how do we had to double down on it. Um, and what are some of the issues we had to actually deal with. And we had to improve, like, um, first aid um, and mental health training for our managers. I've got a question over here. Um, I'm Ken, Ken Baker from the National Disability Insurance Agency. And congratulations to all of you um, for doing what you're doing. And my question is about the role of government. Um, do you think government should have a role in assisting what you're doing? If, it is, if, they, if government does have a role, if they can assist, if government could assist, what, what would you like government to do or maybe stop doing? Um, I made a submission to the NDIS last week on behalf of Sunpork. Um, our biggest challenge, well, there's two with NDIS or... The, 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 Sorry, I'm not very fluent in NDIS and DIA. Um, but our biggest challenges are twofold. One is we find our employees actually um, often end up with reduced entitlements um, upon gaining work. There seems to be a perception that having a job means you have lower support requirements and I'd argue that it's, it's, entirely, it's exactly the reverse. Um, maintaining a job requires different supports but support... Nevertheless, um, the other challenge we see is the lack of support for employers. So everything, I, I, th I think if you support employers, then by extension you can support more employees. You get a greater scale of value. So you could support one individual and that one individual reaps some benefits. You could support one employer and you may have employment opportunities and support for 10, 20, 100, 1,000 employees. So I think there's a lot of value to be um, gained out of engaging with employers and finding out what we need um, to do what we do better because in some books, example, we are these days entirely self-funded. Add to that. Um, I think I echo, I echo a lot of the comments there. I think it's also what, you, what we find is that the events after work is kind of grey line between um, work and life. Is probably it's a very it definitely is a grey line, and um, so an event can happen at home, and before you know it, it's it's, it's spilling into the workplace. Um, and it's actually kind of understanding those things and what support does an employer actually have to play, and what does the government provide? And um, one of the things we've um, from our from talking to all our employees and all people in the program, it's some of these mental health. Um, you know, pr um, support networks, which is kind of critical as part of it. It's not just the autism support. It's also the kind of life skill support as well. Um, you guys c come from organisations with pretty significant resources. If I can give you a hypothetical, if you were to be part of a significantly smaller organisation, example would be a regional accounting firm, for example. What would be the first few things that you would do and how would you implement a program for hiring neurodiverse individuals f with a small organisation? Daniel, do you want to have a go? Uh, I can start. Um, so, so I think a lot of the lessons learned, even though we're a fairly large organisation, can be applied on a smaller scale, right? So, you know, my team, um, we're 100 plus individuals, but where we've placed the team members is in a team of 20 to start, yeah? And we've almost ring fenced that team to go, okay, from a training, from an integration, from a, you know, awareness standpoint, we're, we're going to run you almost independently. Yeah. So the the level of training that we apply to that cohort is fairly significant. The level of oversight and monitoring we have is fairly significant. 
the level of reporting and dialogue that we have is continuous in nature. So, so I don't think you need to have you know, 35,000 employees in order to build a pretty robust, mature program in order to do it. I would just say, you know, just, just scale it down accordingly, right? So if you've got a, a workforce of 100, then have a look at the level of training you think is going to be required across that organisation. What support structures are you putting in place? Who are going to be the individuals um, working closely with your diverse staff members? And how can they best be supported going forward? So, so I think there are, irrespective of your size, there are lessons that can be learned across the board. Great. I think we've got um, uh, yes. a question um, here. I'm also from NAB, so I'm keen to talk about how you might like to take this more broadly. Um, <clears throat> I work in the corporate and institutional bank, so very different from where you are, but still really interested in understanding. Um, my question is um, a little bit um, to uh, Kirsty's point about don't hire for a, t for a role, hire a person. And my question is to what extent have you had to redesign <laughs> roles uh, that exist because that comes to the FTE question, doesn't it? Um, to what extent have you had to redesign roles so that you can uh, suit the skill set? It's probably not so much about redesigning roles as having flexibility within those roles. So the um, part-time, full-time um, scenario is one to think about. All of our employees start part-time and they build up to full-time based on their individual capabilities. So I guess it's starting to think about individuals as individuals. So if you had four people start, one might take a month to go full-time, another might take a year. And someone else may never go full-time, they might go four days a week. Um, so there's been a, a... We've certainly flexed a lot in that area and it hasn't... It, it's great for us because traditionally jobs in agriculture are full-time or they're not there at all. So you start thinking about other... Um, potential workforces within your community, say, for example, um, mothers of children who could come out and do part-time work. So you open up that opportunity by virtue of what you're doing within the autism program. Um, within the jobs itself, we... I wanted, it was mentioned earlier about identifying people's interests and strengths and giving them more opportunities to follow that. And as a business, Sunport does that generally, so it hasn't been a difficult transition for us to make to to extend that to our autistic employees. If people are interested, we have we run an RTO. Um, so there's opportunities for people to extend and learn in areas of special interest and we just try and help people identify them and, and support them to follow those interests. Right. I'm just wondering, we talk a lot about neurodiverse um, strengths, uh, but in the hiring process and in the performance evaluation process, there's often a checklist of strengths a ch checklist of capabilities that we assess people by. How have you gone about uh, managing that process with your HR departments and um, prioritising the strengths as opposed to prioritising the weaknesses? So you don't mind. Yeah, I can touch on that one. I was going to say, as part of the program, before we even went through a selection process to find candidates, we literally sat down with our HR department and looked at the types of jobs we were looking to fill and literally in the job profile looked at the strengths that we were looking for, as you would with any em employee, quite frankly, of what am I looking for, but also then looking uh, with the assistance that we got externally of what were those strengths that might match someone who was, um, you know, neurodiverse. So we literally did a... Because, you know, not, not everybody ticks every box in every job profile um, and you will have strengths and weaknesses and you always make that balance. So, but we literally looked through types of jobs where certain strengths were beneficial to those jobs and those were the jobs that we initially targeted as part of our program. And it was a deliberate... We wanted the program to be successful, so it was very much let's look at where in the business we would start and what types of jobs we would start with. Great. I think we've got a question down here. Um, just a wonderful conference. Um, um, I can say something about NDIS... Uh, DSP, TPD, try and get it all in one line. Um, I had a lot of interest a long time ago with a certain technology, technology, electronics, computers, that sort of stuff, right? Transitioned and I now find that some of the stuff that I couldn't cope with was what we've been talking about and I was in and out, in and out of the job market and so on, right? So um, you, you land into um, Centrelink and then Centrelink recognises, oh, okay, um, you might not be good uh, if, you, if there's a DES part, okay, DES. 
Um, and then um, they supposedly have staff and have been connected with a, a group. Um, and when I first started, more than 77 months ago, because that's the, or weeks ago, that's because there's a, there's a tick box at that level. Um, they've suddenly got a lot of, they've got psycho psychologists and um, all these people. And um, I applied for an NDIS um, and it's been knocked back. But the rejection form is almost better than the application form, the first application form, because at least it tells you what you didn't get. Yeah. So I've, they sent me a new form and I've got it in here, right? And it's brilliant because it actually gives, yeah, a lot of separated qualities and, um, yeah. So I'm trying to get an org um, my NDIS um, assistant helper, yeah, from, I'm trying not to mention too many names. Um, she says, let's organize a meeting with your doctor, right, to go along. But my doctor has on several occasions, when he tried to fill in this form before, said, oh, you're fine, right? And I say, okay, I, um, I can work on certain things. And on a good day, I go in for something else, like you know, statins or something. You go in and say, okay. And he says, oh, you look fine. I said, well, you should see me two hours before and two hours after, <laughs> right? And my partner comes to help me to get the food because it's on there, but because I can't organize to put it together, right? I've got lots of so, uh, donated food and all that sort of stuff. So that haven't, you've, you've answered all this. It's one of the wonderful stuff. So I sometimes think if I could get a bit of help to do some of the things and it sounds like you've been a little teenage boy, right? Well, maybe, yeah? Uh, you, certain things you can't do. You really can't organize certain things. It takes me ages in the shower you know, to do that. So I've avoided that uh, sometimes. But if you can get above that, you feel as if you could work, yeah? But then the doctor says, oh, could you do this all week? And I think, mm, uh, maybe a couple of days. And you go into, I go into a lot of tech meetings with new program languages and uh, computer languages and stuff, tech things, right? And they say, oh, you can do this. And I mentioned you know, secretly, autism, they say, oh, it doesn't matter, but I don't think they know what it is. <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah, and I have to make the first move, and for me to make the phone call, yeah, I paced back and forwards and organised a, um, a, a rat run in the carpet, back, back, back and forwards, before I actually get to something, and then sometimes they're really good, and they say, okay, fine, and I can talk then for hours, and I'm bored them to death. <laughs> <laughs> and I still don't know what they wanted to know, and they don't either. So, I... Um, the new application form, um, look, I've gone on too long, this is me, this is me. I've, the new application form, I'm sort of a bit nervous. Do I get my, um, I had a really good doctor and he's left. Um, I, do I get my alternative one who sometimes thinks I'm really good? Or do I get a separate one that can look at the feet, look at the notes and say, right, he's got this, he's got this. Because the new form is, is really good. Thank you very much for the lady, the guy over there, right? The, um, the NDIS person. Uh, the new form is better than the last form I had. And I think, oh, there's a chance here. Ask me different questions. We want direct answers. Do you want a cup of coffee? Yes, right, coffee over there, right. Do you feel like a drink? Oh, do you know how a bit thirsty? That's a not, that doesn't work with us, mostly. Do you want to be direct? Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think there's, uh, the, what, one of the things that I want to pick out from, from there is that kind of direct feedback, um, particularly early on um, and from an employer perspective. What is it that we are looking at and, and thinking about how we articulate that in a different way? So, um, Michael, do you, could you yeah, maybe speak I, I about that? I think one of the things we've learned is actually um, when you're actually looking at work profiles and into jobs is actually look at tasks. What tasks need to be done? Then actually then looking at what skill sets are needed for those tasks. And then moving away from this idea of a job description, which is... Um, if we all know that, you know, you, you look at, look, you go down at, I know, I'll go down and look at, I do 70%, the 30 other, 30% 30 I can't do, I'll bullshit that, that'd be fine. Um, but, you know, we, that's kind of what we look at, but maybe, maybe that's my personality. But the key part is that we took, we moved that away and actually moved to more narratives. So what does the job entail? You know, what does actually, what does a day in the life look like? And that's, I think, more important. And then, and then we found that was actually very more applicable to gender, it was quite interesting that we had a lot more females actually actually was associating with what a day in the life was. So that was, um, I think, about when you're looking at reform of your processes. That's one thing you know it needs to be considered. That's great. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry we've we've run out of time. Um, <laughs> did, didn't, didn't think we were going to get to run out of time, but we we have run out of time. Um, just, I, wa I want to say an enormous thank you to all of our panellists, not just for being here today, but for 
all of the wonderful work that you've um, been doing in driving greater understanding and, and um, opportunities for diverse workforces. Just a couple of things that really resonated um, and themes that were coming through from there. The, the absolute need for leadership um, and for leaders to be on board with this um, and a reliance upon the, the lone fool in the hill, those individuals who just never, ever give up. Um, the benefits of this are clearly much, much broader than just for the, the participants and for neurodiverse people. It's, you know, whether it's mental health, um, any, anything else, it's just the, the benefits are, are great and social. Um, the challenges that I heard had absolutely nothing to do with neurodiverse people. They were all to do with everybody else. And so recognizing that that's actually where the challenge lies, I think is really important. The need for us to build things for the person rather than for a role. And the last message that I heard come through loud and clear is just do it. Just go and do it. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>